So Mike Conley is, um, yeah, Mike is amazing. Mike has been doing this, um, uh, doing this, the, the, the Mike's monthly minute every, every month for five years. I uh, hadn't missed a beat. Um, and he's always comes up with something new. So if we are, um, I'm hoping Sean is over there in the background taking care of me here. Do I have to? We're going to talk tonight about uh, walking into existing homes and looking at trusses and determining what kind of condition they're in and uh, things like that. Explain a little bit about the engineering behind them. Uh, why do we need trusses? Well, they carry a load. They carry the roof load, which could be light or heavy, depending on what kind of roofing material is being used. But they do support the live and dead loads. The live loads would be somebody standing on the roof. would be a snow load. would be a live load. The dead load would be the material itself. It would be the roofing material. It would be the roof sheathing. It would be the truss. That would be the dead load, which is going to be a constant. Live loads vary depending on what time of the year it is and how many people are standing on the roof, if any. And that, those loads have to be accounted for. They have to be distributed evenly throughout the roof area, working their way out to the outer walls of a building, typically, because that's where the structure is. And from there, allowing that load to go down into the footer of the building and uh, throughout the ground where it dissipates as it spreads out throughout the ground, eventually reaching zero. Pretty simple when you look at it. So what's the point of engineered lumber? Well, trusses, whether for roofs or floors, are designed to carry and transfer loads to bearing points and eventually to the ground, as I just mentioned. This is done by placing lumber segments in tension or compression that act as one piece of lumber. A truss is considered a single piece of lumber, even though it's made up of multiple pieces of lumber. And connecting these pieces, of course, is done with gussets or gang plates, which make those pieces immovable. There are two basic types of attics and the trusses that are found in them. We have load-bearing trusses, typically used for storage or allowed for storage. And we have non-bearing trusses where they're not designed to carry any load except the load they were designed to carry, which is the roof load. Generally, roofs under 312 slope do not have storage designed in the truss. That's a general rule of thumb. Truss loading according to ICC, there's no quick answer when evaluating existing truss loading in a house. The general rule of thumb is this, a live load of 10 pounds per square foot to the bottom cord with no storage built into it. A live load of 20 pounds per square foot if the attic height exceeds 30 inches. And that's typically the minimal amount of attic a person can actually get into. And of course, trusses can be designed to accommodate any load they want. It has to be done initially when the truss is designed for the particular house it's going to serve. This is all predicated on having access. If there's no access, the assumption is there's no storage. Now that's a variable because people, as, as houses gain age, people change things and do things and they might have, they might have originally, for example, had a attic access that got blocked up or it might not have had an access, an attic access that somebody put in one. So things change over time and you have to consider all those variables depending on the age of the house. And by the way, we're gonna be talking about, when we talk about loads, except for the live and dead loads of the roof cover, storage loads, I mean, is gonna be on the bottom court only. <clears throat> and that's why, by the way, when you go in and see a air conditioning air handler suspended from the truss, they never attach it to the bottom cord. They always attach it to the upper cord or the top cord. Uh, rise to run versus span, overall span of a truss versus the pitch or the angle of a truss. These all have individual meanings. Rise to run refers to the, the distance horizontally going into the interior of the building in comparison to the rise uh, or, or the vertical rise of the truss. So a 412 truss, for example, would be four inches in and 12 inches up and so forth. Span refers to the overall length of the truss from outer wall to outer wall. And the pitch is the angle of the truss. And that's usually uh, shown in degrees. For example, a 212 pitch is typically considered a 10% pitch. It's also considered a flat roof. <clears throat> 
So why do we see problems with trusses? Manufacturing instructions, which come with trust, deli trust delivery, states that. And it's a universal. This is on every trust you see. Trusses should be stored level. They should be stored off the ground. They should be protected from the elements and kept dry. Those three things are always violated in real life. And here's a good example of it right here. You see this all the time. Manufacturing defects are also another factor. It's rare, but sometimes the manufacturer screws up the truss. It's not always caught by the framer when they put them in because they're busy doing other things or a lot of different things. And that's where we come in. <clears throat> Spawning structural, structural issues may affect a home and its purchase. Some examples of manufacturing defects. Missing gangplay. Missing or misplaced gangplay. <clears throat> missing gangplay. Not, not common, but it, it does happen. And it affects the ability of the trust to do its job. Damage during installation, very common for that to happen. That's why, that's why they hooked the crane up right there. That's right, exactly why, yeah. They get kind of rough with them. Broken uh, member because of uh, the installation or during installation. Misplaced gang plate. Now, the gang plate, the general rule for a gang plate is it needs to be tied up against the wood. If it's more than a 16 inch of gap, it's considered defective. They do allow up to a 16 inch, which is not a lot. <clears throat> when you see them in this condition, that's definitely not going to function as designed. Poor delivery and stacking. Poor delivery and stacking. Installation damage. Field modified trusses. We see this a lot also in real life, especially when a house has been around for a while. People go up there and do damage to the trust, not realizing that they're affecting the ability of the trust to do its job. They've affected the engineering capacity of it. That two by four is not going to function due to the fact that some of it's missing. Remember now, these members are going to be in compression and in tension, which is the pulling apart. That's why you see these diagonals and trusses. They address compression and tension. Mixing lumber is also a no-no. A lot of people don't realize this, but typically yellow pine or spruce pine fir versus southern yellow pine. The trusses are designed to be used or built with a specific lumber in mind and whatever the capacity of the lumber is. And you can't arbitrarily change that lumber out into something else because the configuration of the changed out lumber is not the same as the southern yellow pine or the spruce pine fir. You gotta use the same lumber. That does not affect, however, the cross bracing. That's okay. That's typically gonna be number two fir anyway. It's the construction of the truss that has to be uniform. Quickie repair, no good. No good. Bowing is also a factor that comes into mind, especially uh, there, it's difficult to see these when you're dealing with existing else, but it's very easy to spot them when you're dealing with new construction. And the general rule of thumb is if it's bowed more than an inch and a half from vertical or diagonal or whatever the straight line is, then it's considered defective. Same thing here. That's a good two or three inches right there. Maximum lean, trusses lean on occasion for because they, the straps were put in improperly or in an improper location. Something happened where they didn't match up and the framer just went ahead and made it fit. They have requirements for that. So basically the rule of thumb is D over, one, over 50 or a maximum of two inches out of vertical. How do you determine that? D, by the way, is a depth, which is going to be the top cord and the bottom cord. That's considered the depth. If you've got a 36 inch truss in depth, you can't be leaning more than three quarters of an inch. If you're dealing with a six foot truss in depth, 
It can be leaning more than an inch and a half and so forth. But under no circumstances beyond 96 inches can it lean more than two inches. So you can eyeball these pretty much pretty easily when you're looking at them. Homer say, homeowner says, I need some, I need some uh, storage. I need attic storage. I need it now. What are you going to do? Tear off the roof? Re, retruss it? I don't think so. Look at that beautiful area right there. That could be a great man cave. Could be a great uh, second bedroom. But that damn diagonal's in the way. What are we going to do about that? Instant storage or whatever you want to use it for. Any questions? That would be a bad plan, right? Removing those diagonals. That would be very bad, yes. You know, I found one one time where a guy had done that. He had removed all the um, uh, all of the webs and, um, and, and then put it on the market for sale. He had a pull down stair. I went up there. I mean, he had done a beautiful job of doing exactly what you just showed right there. I came down okay. out of the, yeah, I came down out of the attic and he says to me, he says, um, he's just as proud as he could be. And I says, So what'd you think of my office? And I said, Man, you did a really good job of doing a really stupid thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that's you know, true. Said, you know what he said? He said, he said, Oh, oh, okay, I'll put it all back. <laughs> it's like Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how are you gonna put it back? You need an engineer to tell you how to put it back. Exactly. Uh, that's the other thing, too, uh, Hollis. Uh, people uh, go up there and they'll, they'll scab on things on broken trusses. There's actually it's a pretty sophisticated repair that has to be done. Uh, I'm seeing uh, repairs that are way short of where they should be. I'm talking uh, anywhere from 100 to 150 nails on a, on a scab just to make it done right. Eight-foot, 10-foot, two-by-fours as scabs. And you never see that, of course.